and God stands uh, vehemently opposed to rape. Not only because I, that it's a horrible, it's, it's horrible in and of itself on its own, but also because it corrupts the gospel. Like it, it, is, it preaches a false gospel. It, it corrupts the sacred reality that the icon is designed to point to. It twists and inverts it. It is a, it's, it's an, rather than an icon of salvation, it's an idol of sin. Like it exalts the self and self taking self pleasure, self, whatever at the expense of the other for, yeah. for self. Yeah. So I think the language of generosity like helps explain why rape is so tragic because it's not only what it does to the other person, um, but added to that as well is the horror of its corruption of the message embedded in sex. Hello and welcome to The Naked Gospel, where we explore, imagine, and re-envision what it looks like to follow Jesus and to actually know his gospel, to know his gospel with our bodies, with our relationships, and with our imaginations, and particularly with our sexuality. I am your host, Shane O'Neill, and today I am joined by Joshua Ryan Butler. Josh uh, is... He's in Arizona. Uh, he's been married for 13 years. He's got three kids uh, and he's a pastor. Uh, he's written a number of books and I came across him for the first time on a, a podcast called Unbelievable a number, a number of years ago. And then I've, I've heard him on other podcasts since then. And I just really appreciated, uh, I appreciated his mind and his heart. It seems like he's cultivated both and really in, in meaningful ways. And it doesn't seem like necessarily one is bigger than the other, but I just like how integrated he is as uh, well as a human being. Uh, and he's got a teaching. He's got a teaching series on sex as salvation, which made me think of uh, of a quote that we had heard on this on this podcast recently uh, by Chesterton about how every every man is looking for salvation, even the man who walks into a brothel. Uh, and how our hearts really are longing for salvation, longing for Jesus. Uh, we just end up finding it in really beat up ways. And if you're listening to this podcast, then like me, you've been you've been told that that sex doesn't matter. Uh, and you've been taken captive by that narrative, uh, whether that's through pornography or hookup culture or through divorce. Uh, I don't know. It's 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 ravished us. And they've told us. We've been told that it doesn't matter all the while. It, it's it's such a powerful icon that it's become kind of the primary primary cultural symbol here, here in the West. And so on one hand, we're told that it doesn't matter, doesn't have any power. And on the other, we see us orient an entire culture around it. And that dissonance is, well, it's real. It's a real dissonance. And so I want to know... I want to know. I want to know what sex is an icon for. I want to know what sex is made to represent and what it's here for. And I want to know what God has to say about sex. I'm I'm interested about what God has to say about sex. So I invited Josh on, and uh, we're going to jump into that. If you enjoy this episode, please share it with somebody you think would benefit from it. And your comments are always welcome. Uh, but enough of that, Josh. Thank you so much for being on today, man. Hey, thanks, Shane. It's awesome getting to be on here with you. Dude, I, when I write, I do Shane James O'Neill, and it's very intentional. I'm not trying to be some kind of winsome writer uh, per se, but I am always interested when other people have the, the kind of the three names, Joshua, uh, Ryan Butler, apart from it sounding really cool. Is there is there a bit of a story behind that? No, dude, Josh is great. Everybody calls me Josh. I think it was more with the publisher as we're looking at the first book coming out. And nobody knows who that guy is, which is fine. <laughs> you know, but the, the full name can help make it a little more distinctive in case there's other butlers over there. So I know that, my, my, my dad felt really convicted when I was born that uh, Joshua is supposed to be his first name. And they used to always get ticked when I was a kid and they would call me Josh. Like, no, it's Joshua. It's Joshua. Reality now is everybody calls me Josh, not Joshua. But uh, I, I figured, hey, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just use the whole the, the full throttle, all three words, what they gave me. Very cool. Right. Very cool. Well, I, I like that you're here today. So thank you for joining us. And I, I know because we were talking before this, that you, uh, that you enjoy wrestling with people through stuff, uh, that you're in, you're in Arizona now in a kind of a college town so that you can wrestle with college students through their, st through their stuff. And it sounds like it's something that you particularly enjoy and you've been pastoring for a number of years. So I, yeah. I love that you're here to talk to, to us about this stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah, n not like literal wrestling. So I'm pretty weak. I don't, I'm not. I'm not that. For sure. <laughs> <Strong>. <laughs> Me and uh, you no, both. No, I, love, 
I love helping people who wrestle with some of the tough topics of the faith. That's part of my story. You know, came to Christ uh, mm-hmm. really in college and had, had a long season of wrestling through uh, Christianity mm-hmm. and the gospel and what does it mean. Mm-hmm. And we're here in Tempe, which is a college town, Arizona State University, one of the largest college campuses in the country in terms of student population. It goes back and forth with one other as being the largest. So mm-hmm. big college town, uh, love just uh, students that, that, that demographic of your life where as for me, I think it's a time where many of us are kind of wrestling through how to follow Jesus. What does the gospel actually mean? Wrestling through big questions of life. And uh, yeah, so me and my family, we love being a part of the kingdom and what God's doing here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's actually when I was, I had Preston on recent, Preston Sprinkle on recently. And during that, I, I communicated that, um, that God actually, that God wrestling with me through my stuff is one of my favorite things about him, that he, outlasts outlasts my doubt and he doesn't power play me with his glory or his position his title uh he outlasts me he makes days for me and he spends he just like wants to get to know me like he is he is truly something else even the uh philippians 2 about the humility of god and you just look at god and you're like it's not it's not intuitive and i know theology throughout the ages has gone back and forth on the humility of god but when i look at that I just can't help but say that God is remarkably humble in his disposition towards us. Uh, and so I, I love that you enjoy wrestling as well. And that's really the kind of the nature of your book, uh, your second book. It was The Pursuing God. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, the whole theme of, of that one was, uh, you know, it's not so much about us going out to find God. It's God coming out to find us mm-hmm. and how that reframes just the whole Christian life. That's probably one of the biggest I had experienced back in college my experience with faith was God really going, man, you've had this thing backwards, Josh. This isn't about you coming out to find me. I've been the one coming out to find you. Mm-hmm. It's really just the nature of grace, how that, that changes everything that it's, it's God's pursuit of us and his world. Amen. Yeah. I remember Henry Nowen saying that, that, uh, when that, that thought, when that reality hit him, it changed everything about his spiritual formation. So yes. I, uh, I love all of that. Uh, let's, let's get to the topic cause you're easy to banter with and I, I will get lost in the banter. Um, sex as salvation. That was the, the title of the sermon. And as I understand it, you're working on a book on, on this very topic. Um, mm-hmm. so I guess just, just starting off even with the title, why sex as salvation? Can you walk us through the thinking there? Great. Cool. Yeah. So for the sermon, it was really just going, uh, kind of a double entendre, right? Like a double meaning on the one hand going, man, we live in a culture that is often looking to sex for salvation. There's a sense of this is where I'm going to find meaning. This is where I'm going to find fulfillment. I'm going to save me from my loneliness. It's going to save me from my sense of alienation. It's going to save me from these things. Uh, but like many things, when we turn a good thing into an ultimate thing, it can really leave us dissatisfied yeah. in the long run. It, it can become idle. Um, but on the flip side going, I do believe though, sex is a relationship to salvation going, uh, I want to say sex is an icon of salvation. Like it's something that God has designed to point us to the reality of Christ in the church Mm -hmm. and the union with God that we were made for in in Christ. And so, uh, we get in trouble when we're looking to sex to save us. (laughs) And yet, uh, there's something helpful and healthy and beautiful when we begin to look at uh, sex for the salvation that it points to the greater union with Christ as his church that, that we were designed for. And so the, um, the idea of icon that that's kind of, as you mentioned, the, the new book coming out, like the idea there is the, the tentative title right now is sex icon, um, restoring the beauty of the Christian sexual ethic. And, uh, the idea of something being iconic, uh, historically icons were meant not so much to be looked at as to be looked through mm-hmm. like that. They were, a window into a greater transcendent reality, you know? And I want to suggest similarly that in the gospel, we find that sex is uh, iconic. It's designed to point to these greater realities. And the book kind of like, like the structure of creation, the nature of salvation, uh, abundance of the kingdom, a couple different things that sex points us to. Yeah. But for salvation, uh, maybe a good place to start might be Ephesians 5.32, yeah. where the apostle Paul, he says, uh, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. Uh, and he goes on to say, this is a great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And that first half there, what he's doing, he's quoting Genesis 2. He's quoting kind of the foundational, like, wedding formula verse mm-hmm. in Genesis 2, that for a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. Um, 
that language of leaving and being united, it's, it's language of covenant in Hebrew. It's like a language of actually covenant marriage, marital commitment. Uh, but then within that context that the two will become one flesh. And so Paul is saying like this wedding formula and the foundation of the biblical story, it's actually iconic. It's designed to point to something even greater, which is Christ in the church. Uh, it's a great mystery. Uh, the phrase you use in Greek, mega, mega mystery. It's a mega mysterion. It's a, mm. it's a mega mystery. Mm. But this wedding at the foundation of creation of Adam and Eve, whatever, like this is a window, a foreshadowing, a, a picture that God has given of the greater union that we were designed for with Christ as his church. Mm. So the picture there, I believe Paul is essentially saying like marriage is iconic. Mm. Um, only it's not only marriage, the leave and cleave, like the leaving your father and mother being united to uh, the, the marriage language in Hebrew. It's also the one flesh union, mm. which is really uh, in the Bible, it's a sex language. It's talking about the sexual union of a husband and wife, that conjugal union itself. It's not just the vows they make, or it's not just the life lived together as a like marriage. It's actually the sexual union of a couple as well mm. is an icon of salvation. Like one flesh and sex is an icon of salvation. Mm. So in that sermon and as well, that's one of the chapters out of like 16 chapters in the book. One of, one of them is trying to go, mm. how is sex an icon of salvation? Like what does sexual union, what does the sexual union of a husband and wife reveal about the nature of our union with Christ as his church? Mm. So many questions drop out of that. We had a, a woman on named Lori Krieg. I think that's how you, say, how you say her last name. Are you familiar with her? No. <laughs> Lori Krieg. Craig. Um, she's, uh, gosh, she's, she, she has same sex attraction. She's married to a guy named Matt and they have this book that came out called an impossible marriage. And, uh, and so she has same sex attraction. He's, he's got, he's attracted to women. Um, and, uh, and they're married. Um, and so she had to wrestle real big with the Ephesians five and really appreciated her reflections on, on, uh, in, in a sense of, 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 uh, sex being, um, a metaphor within a metaphor. And it, it allowed her to ask the question of, of, you know, in sex, what am I metaphoring or mm -hmm. what are you metaphoring? Uh, which mm -hmm. is a really powerful question. Uh, it's it's been sitting inside of me since then, and I, I've really appreciated it. Um, but even as you speak, uh, I, I reckon the word union is probably like glossing right over people. Uh, I I don't think I I knew the significance of union until my adulthood with Jesus. Uh, and even then, I mean, I, I'm still trying to wrap my arms around it, but. Uh, but understanding union as a major aspect of salvation, uh, at least as far as Paul is concerned, uh, which is significant. So a lot, a lot of us, uh, we conceive of salvation as kind of the, the, just this kind of forensic thing where all of a sudden Jesus died and I get to go to heaven and like, I'm once saved, always I'm saved. I'm good, you know? And, and then like trying to figure out how to make it until we get there, you know, until, until, until we die and God takes us to heaven. And so even as you say union, uh, I, I want you to play that out for us. Cause that is, it is scattered throughout scripture. Like, like gems on a landscape, it, it, just this, this language of Christ being in us and us being in Christ and Jesus, Jesus, it like to dazzle me with like, well, the father's in me and I'm in you and he's in, you know, and I'm like, what the heck is going on? But something really intimate, he's describing something very intimate. And I was wondering if you could just help us with that. When you say union, can you play that out? Definitely. So salvation is union with Christ. I right? like, so uh, I would say sex is an icon of salvation because salvation is union with Christ. Mm -hmm. And that can be challenging because sometimes we think of salvation as more centered around other things like going to heaven when you die or fixing things on earth. But really the primary New Testament language for salvation is union with Christ. As you mentioned, uh, hundreds of times, there's like, I think 254 from right, you know, times mm -hmm. where the language of us being in Christ is used, you know, like, for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus in Romans 8 would be mm. just one of dozens, of, loads yeah. of examples. On the flip side, you also have loads of examples everywhere about Christ being in us, mm. Christ in us, the hope mm. of glory. Mm. And so when the New Testament wants to talk about salvation, the primary language they use is the language of mutual indwelling, of us being in Christ, of mm. Christ being in us, uh, mm. of union with Christ. Mm. Now, 
that's significant because I think sometimes we tend to think of salvation more as, um, say maybe like going to heaven when you die. Right. Yeah. And, uh, that's not important, but it's where that, that that's, that's, it's actually Christ is how heaven has come to us and union with him is how we can access the very life of heaven, God's presence here and now, mm-hmm. or some people, I think other traditions would make salvation. It's more about fixing everything here on earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the reality is that, uh, man, the deepest fracture that needs to be fixed here on earth is our alienation from God, our distance mm-hmm. from the creator as his creation. And union with Christ is really the focal point where we get the, the best of heaven and we get earth fixed. And all that ultimately is all wrapped up in the person of Jesus and union with him as his mm-hmm. people. He is the center of salvation. So the, the heart of salvation is in the body of Jesus, mm-hmm. right? It's in union with him that we actually get that, uh, all, all the peripheral benefits that, that, that come mm. from salvation are all centered around our union with Christ as his people. Mm. Uh, yeah. So the reason I think that sex is an icon of salvation is because salvation at its core is union with Christ. Mm. This is a, this is off, off my notes a bit, but Josh, uh, union. So, uh, let's see. So as I'm as I'm conceiving of it, as you're talking about it, I'm seeing union being the entire framing and then and then within that framing, all of a sudden that animates or that at least positions what it means to why we pray or why we do acts of charity or why we submit to those sorts of things. The kind of spiritual formation practices of of, well, practicing gentleness, kindness, love, whatever, it's all framed within this picture of union um, is that, is that the case? Is that the case for you? Am I picturing it right? Is that like kind of the primary framing? And then when it comes to like, I pray because he's my lover, is that, is that the idea? Great. No. Uh, yeah. So maybe to get nerdy here for a moment, you know, but I'd say like salvation, this union with Christ is Trinitarian. And so it involves, uh, the spirit of Christ, his presence actually within us as his church, as his people, that the indwelling of, of Christ's presence, the spirit of God inside of us, mm. and I, the person of Christ of Jesus before us, let's so speaking, I'd say the reality of the father over us, you know, mm. and so this union with Christ, it's all encompassing. It's, it's within us by his spirit. It's before us in the presence of Jesus. It's uh, surrounding us, the, the father who holds all things together. And so this union with Christ, it's um, everything is encompassed in that. Like you mentioned, mm-hmm. the fruit of the spirit, the gift of the spirit the, is actually the manifestation of the life of Jesus sanctifying and working its way in us from the inside out. So mm-hmm. the it's the love, joy, peace, patience. It's the love of Jesus. It's the patience of Jesus. It's the kindness of Jesus. It's the gentleness of Jesus. It's all those fruits of the spirit. And it's really the fruits of his spirit mm-hmm. indwelling us mm-hmm. uh, that Christ indwells he gives his church his very uh, the seed of his word and the presence of his spirit within his the church that actually shapes and forms us as his people from the inside out i love all of that i i and it challenges me in big ways hey family lent is upon us uh lent is the time when we intentionally get to feel with god uh, considering he went through a lot to feel with us. Uh, Lent is where we get to see the longings and the passion of Jesus and him coming to step into our world as a co-sufferer uh, so that he could send compassion and empathy to us as we suffer. I spend a lot of time avoiding my emotions, my feelings uh, with stimulation and Lent is always good for me, always good for me. And it's, it's always good news to know that there's a God who wants to feel with me as I hurt through life. Uh, So this Lent, I'm gonna actually be reading this book. It's called The Proven Path by Joel Hesch. Uh, It's the story, well, it's three stories. Uh, Three different guys who are struggling with lust in three different ways. And they're from different demographics. Some of them are married, some of them have different ethnic backgrounds, different ages. So I'm really looking forward to it because it allows me, well, the plurality of their stories allows me to see my story and their stories. Uh, so I wanted to invite you into this reading, into reading The Proven Path with me, uh, and to, well, just engaging that parts of who we are so that we could start to prepare ourselves for Easter and for resurrection and for all that Jesus, well, really actually has for us instead of just lip service to something that we don't necessarily believe. So uh, come read this with me. It'll be in a link down below. 
Uh, thank you. And let's get back to the episode. If you're willing to share, I, I, I'd be curious to know, because um, you you probably didn't grow up with that understanding of salvation. You probably inherited it somehow. And I'd be interested to know how it's reframed your relationship with Jesus um, mm-hmm. when it comes to those specific spiritual formations. Because how you frame things really dictates how you live them, or at least how you like, what's your goal? You know, like when I, when I wake up, I, I can pray, but if my motivation to pray is so that God will like me, uh, mm. uh, then it's an entirely different sort of motivation than, uh, than literally God making a day and kind of waiting for me to wake up so that he could be really excited and start showing the day to me, uh, yeah. l- like a lover would, like you wake up in bed, um, so I'd be interested to know, just just for like you, Josh, like has that been significant for you in your life? Yes, you know, I, I would say uh, there is a scandal of intimacy to the gospel. I believe you know a scandal of intimacy that has really, um, man, been central to my walk with Christ. And so <laughs> I remember a, a friend of mine. She she came to faith, kind of you know started following Jesus. And she's like, I love Jesus, but she was annoyed by some of the like worship songs, worship music in the church. You know, she, she called it a Jesus is my boyfriend music. You know, like, she said, like, there's some songs where it feels like it's like a Katy Perry song. And you just swapped out the word for the guy with, with the word Jesus, you know? Yeah. And, and I remember asking him like, Oh, well, you know, uh, what is it about that that bothers you? She said, she said you know, it just seems that, um, it's almost kind of sacrilegious that, mm. God is so transcendent and holy and, and all that we would talk about him in such intimate terms. And I remember and Tony, you know, I, I get it. I mean, there's some cheesy worship music out there. There's some songs that are maybe overdone or not, whatever, you know, but I, I go the reality. I think the scandal of the gospel is, yeah, Jesus isn't our boyfriend. He's our husband. <laughs> so it's like going like, mm-hmm. like for us mm-hmm. corporately as the bride of Christ, that there is this intimacy, this union with the King of the universe, that our creator, that God, that Yahweh has taken on flesh for our salvation has come drawn close to us in the incarnation that he's all gone all the way to the cross in the grave to be united with us in Mm -hmm. the fullness of our condition and our, uh, man, in our depravity and our corruption and our alienation and our death. That's like the marriage bed. That's the place that Christ has gone to unite with us in the fullness of our condition there mm. in order to raise us united with him forever mm. to uh impregnate so to speak if i can use the you know go, go that far to say like with the, the seed of his word and mm. the presence of the spirit to actually fill and unite um his and it gets a corporate picture it's, it's the bride of christ as a whole the body of christ but that we are it, we are actually united with him and when we're united with jesus He's not just Joe Schmo. You know, I mean, we're talking about the king of the universe, dude. Mm-hmm. We're united with our God, our creator, our king. Mm-hmm. And that there is an intimacy with our maker, who's mm-hmm. the one we're made for. And, and going back to the Ephesians 5, I think that's what Paul's saying. is like, dude, that Genesis 2, the wedding formula, it points to the fact that you were made for union mm-hmm. with your maker. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways I think about that is like going like, Man, God, it wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't like, it's not like we get the order backwards. Right? It wasn't like God made human marriage and saw then these couples getting along and goes, oh man, that's a good idea. I should have thought I'm going to do that. <laughs> you know, like, like it wasn't after that. No, it's going like back, back before the beginning, before the foundation for the creation of the world. God's like, dude, I'm going to set and establish a signpost mm-hmm. in humanity. I'm going to create this, this icon, this window, this signpost, this, this whatever, this foreshadowing. And it's going to be like a secret, like a mystery but in its very nature, it's going to point to the destiny that humanity mm. was made for, which is union with me and the wedding piece of the lamb, the kingdom that's coming with our maker. Um, it wasn't an afterthought. It's like the beginning. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when Paul uses the word mystery or mysterion, I think we hear mystery and we think, ah, uh, someone will never get to We're never going to understand. It's just mysterious, like Scooby-Doo or something. You know, it's like, oh, uh, well, they're never going to get it. Like, you know, the, the, there's some kind of secret. They've got to wait till the end of the thing. Yeah. But in the actual word means, um, it's something that was hidden that has now been revealed. So Mysterion is not something you'll never understand. It's something that you didn't get before, but now it's been Mysterion. It's like Scooby-Doo, like the mask is going to oh, pull. That's cool. Thing is now. So Paul's going like, this was mysterious in the sense that we didn't understand it. And now in the gospel, the veil has been pulled off. Like yeah. now we actually, it's been unmasked, so to speak. And uh, it, it's this glorious reality that's been 
mm-hmm. been revealed. And I'd argue, I kind of go back in the book, even in the Old Testament, I'd say like it, it's kind of, it, it's a central theme. Yeah. Yahweh's unique bride is kind of the point that the whole story is oriented towards and the way we in I love, I love all of that. I really do. I, I, uh, and it, it boggles me. It boggles me, uh, the inconsistency of, of our cultures being able to say sex doesn't matter, but don't you dare touch me without my consent. You know, like, don't you dare ab- abuse me. You know, it's like, I, I, I can abuse it if I want, but you can't abuse me. And it's, it's a, a kind of a, a volitional abuse, uh, which is, it's jacked up. And, and I've taken part in that. Like I've, I've willfully given my body in ways that I ought not, you know? And I mean, what is masturbation if not self-abuse, you know? Um, uh, so, cause you draw out certain kind of, can we call them maybe features or characteristics of sex, uh, namely charity and hospitality, um, charity being giving, uh, can you, can you walk that out some? Totally. No, it's great. So in that sermon and kind of in this chapter in the book, one thing I explore is kind of this question of how, how is sex an icon of salvation? Like how is the sexual union of a husband and wife? Like how is this one flesh? Paul says one flesh I'm talking about, two bodies becoming one sexual union. And he says, this is a mystery. I'm talking about Christ in the church. And I want to kind of explore like, dude, how is that? So how does the union of a husband and wife speak to uh, the union of Christ in the church? And the, it's not just the marriage vows and life live together. It's, it's also, it's that also, but it's also their sexual union as a couple. Mm. And the language I like to use. Yeah. Great. I, I actually, so generosity, like generosity and hospitality are the two uh, words that I, 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 want to use to kind of tee that up and just going like when you think of generosity what is generosity well it's giving you know giving of your time of your energy of your money your resource but at the deeper level it's a giving of your very self Mm -hmm. and where is there any more intimate giving of yourself than in sexual union where what you're giving uh particularly on the male side of the equation is the giving of your very self Hmm. Now, nuance that and say, you know, obviously men and women both give to one another in sexual union. Like it's, it's a, there's a mutual self giving of a husband and wife in, hmm. in sex. Uh, so it's obviously it's a both give to one another and both receive from one another in sexual union. But if you kind of get down to the very, uh, you know, the core of, of conjugal union itself, that uh, particularly on the male side of the equation, there is a giving of uh, one's very presence uh, hmm. to not only uh, to their bride, but within the bride, right? So there's a, a generosity that is iconically present in sexual union on that side of the equation. And so if you think of hospitality, like what is hospitality, but it is welcoming the guest, welcoming the other, welcoming the life of the other into the intimacy of one's home and opening the door, so to speak, like preparing uh, that place, that space to welcome mm-hmm. in the life of the other. And where is there any more intimate hospitality than sexual union where particularly on the female side of the equation on the the bridal side of the equation is a welcoming their spouse uh within the very sanctuary of their very self you know like a welcoming of the spouse within sanctuary of the very self so while sex is mutual self-giving i think there's something iconic in this generosity uh, particularly on the male side of the equation and hospitality on the female side of the equation that speaks to uh, the life, the ideal life of a marriage and the ideal life of a church, you know, or the life of the church with Christ, that um, I would suggest that iconically that the life of a marriage with a husband and wife, me and my wife, is to be characterized by mutual self-giving, like beyond just sex, you know, like the, the sexual union is iconic of what married life is supposed to be about. There is a mutual giving to one another and receiving from one another. Uh, but this is also a window into um, Christ in the church, where with Christ in his church, we both give, to, you know, Christ gives to us, we give back to Christ and worship, uh, we receive from Christ, Christ receives our gifts, our things that we bring, you know, and yet at the core foundational level, there is an asymmetry in it that Christ, um, his generosity, he gives of himself in a rich, powerful, unique way where there, there's 
one way to talk about it is if we go into the Old Testament, actually, since one of the most common phrases for sex is um, he went into her. <laughs> like literally in Hebrew, it's he went into her. <laughs> a lot of English translations will soften that and kind of say, you know, like um, they made love or they yes. had sex. Or, but the literal phrase is like he went into her, right? Yeah. And uh, I remember I learned one Sunday how humorous that could be years ago. Uh, we kind of switched to a more literal wooden Bible translation <laughs> one Sunday. And it just happened to be the Sunday that uh, my poor friend, Karen, uh, who you might say she's kind of rated G, right? You know, and, and she was reading the scripture that morning. And it was the story of Jacob with Leah and Rachel, where he ends up marrying two of them, you know? Mm-hmm. And let's just say that the Hebrew phrase for he went into her showed up a lot in that, <laughs> in that passage. So she was publicly reading scripture, you know, and you start to the first one and she kind of stops. Oh. And he went into her and then she keeps going and got a little further and, and he went and, and, and she got more and more red, you know, uh, the, the funny thing was, it was just more like, Karen. <laughs> poor Karen, but just go, I mean, the Bible is less prudish about its language than we are, you know, mm-hmm. one bodily union he went into her. It's actually describing what's happening in the act. Uh, and historically that's often been called um, like the active and passive roles in the equation, right? The, the, on the male side of the equation is this active role of penetrating one's spouse for one's bride. And then on the female side, is kind of the passive of receiving your spouse within yourself. And, um, and I think that's significant when we look to our union with Christ and the nature of salvation is while there's a mutual self-giving between Christ and the church, uh, there's also a sense where um, Christ penetrates his, his bride with the seed of his word, with the presence of his spirit. Uh, and the bride here is a corporate figure. It's, it's like the church cosmically, like the, the whole church, whatever. But, uh, but there is this, this picture of this intimate union that the church has with Christ as our, our King and our Lord, where we receive his presence within us. We receive his word it takes root within us and that Christ's word and his spirit, his seed and his presence, it makes his bride fruitful. It actually mm-hmm. causes her to, bear children of God, to bring us forth as children of God into the world and to nurture and nourish us as the, you know, the bride of Christ, like nurtures and nourishes us as his Mm -hmm. children us up into the world as children of the King and and his bride. Uh, So I don't know, I kind of threw a lot out there, but I think there's this beautiful picture Mm -hmm. of sexual union as an image of Christ's union with his church and the way that he, you know, uh, yeah. And that that relationship Mm -hmm by both generosity and hospitality. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, because I think it, it, I really need to double check this, but I think it's James 1 where it talks about how, like, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Uh, that it's, the receive is, has a, a, a sexual, not just, like, connotation, but denotation, where it's like, like sema or something like that in, in the language. Yeah, yeah it's in First uh, John. I, mean, I have to go back and find the exact, but it talks about us being conceived by the, the sperma of God. Ah, uh, yes. Let's say, you know, like what, what we're talking about. But the, it's the, literally the word seed, which in Greek and in Hebrew, like seed can refer both to like plant seed or human seed. And so when Jesus is telling the parable of the four soils and the planting of the seed, like it's, it's the sperma, you know, wow. the, the, okay. the there. Um, but then it's also the word uh, that's used for human. And, and, and so in the context of first John there, the imagery is, is birth imagery that we have been conceived by uh, the sperm of the seed of God, which is in reference to, uh, I believe his word. It's been a while since I've looked at that passage, but yeah, it's like, no, no, it's it, helpful. God's no, word. all of that is helpful. So when it comes to, I do want to, if you could like specifically play it out. So with, with, with giving generosity, you link that to abuse and and I, I do want to be I, I want to say this word with with a bit of trepidation it's it's a it's an ugly word but rape um and and then hospitality also with with prostitution uh and again even that word prostitution is becoming almost antiquated um and so with with sex workers because it's it's so popular amongst college students and amongst i i to to do the webcamming we kind of just having sex in front it's it spices things up it's very exciting i even had a a friend a few years ago it just it rocked me in the in, in real time it rocked me which she was just like yeah like i want to go home and get a pizza and i was like oh, okay she's just like she's like if i don't have any money so i'm gonna go do some camming and i hope somebody sends me some pizza and i was like oh my god like that's 
you know, and like she did that on a regular basis. Um, and I had, I've had a, a few friends since then who have communicated that and it's just blown mm-hmm. my world apart every time, uh, that yeah. that's a, a way to get, get food every night, you know? Um, so can you link for us the, the generosity with, with the rape and abuse, as well as the hospitality with sex working prostitution? Yes, totally. So, uh, you know, so my, I want to claim it like, so if sex is designed for this generosity and hospitality, and it's designed as an icon of the gospel, the generosity of Christ, hospitality of his church, um, I think that helps explain why rape and prostitution are so tragic, right? Because I'd say they're inversions of, so I want to suggest that uh, rape is the most tragic inversion of generosity and prostitution the most tragic inversion of hospitality. Mm -hmm. With that, if we start with uh, rape, that rape is uh, the most tragic inversion of generosity. Rather than self-giving, it's self-taking. Rather than giving of oneself to the other, it's the taking for oneself from the other. And so it takes what God has designed for generosity and explicitly corrupts and twists it in the most grotesque possible way for the the opposite um, reason. Like it's it's actually, um, instead of waiting for hospitality, it's barging down the door, uninvited, ransacking, taking whatever mm. one wants. It's burglary of the, the highest order. Mm. And God stands uh, vehemently mm. opposed to rape not only because I, that it's a horrible, it's, it's horrible in and of itself on its own, but also because it corrupts the gospel. Like it, it, is, it preaches a false gospel. It, it corrupts the sacred reality that the icon is designed to point to. It twists and inverts it. It is a, it's, it's an, rather than an icon of salvation, it's an idol of sin. Like it exalts the self and self taking self pleasure, self, whatever at the expense of the other for, yeah. for so I think the language of generosity like helps explain why rape is so tragic because it's not only what it does to the other person, um, but added to that as well is the horror of its corruption of the message embedded in sex, so to speak. Right. Um, so there's that. And then on hospitality uh, going, if hospitality is, you know, welcoming, creating a, a space, parent space and welcoming the guests, the other in, uh, the, the tragedy with prostitution is that uh, it turns, you know, kind of rents out the sanctuary for a fee, right? It, it turns hospitality into an act done for uh, for money, for compensation. Uh, if God's design for this is covenant, it's turning the sanctuary into a hostel, so to speak, like a, for travelers passing right. on the way or a, a bus depot, in a sense, for people on their way to the next stop. The transit. And, and so on the one hand, you know, I, I very much empathize with the reality and circumstances that lead some into prostitution. Like there's, uh, man, I, I've known a number of folks who are former sex workers and, you know, who that's been a part of their story and often they have tragic parts of the story. So the point is not necessarily to keep shame on it, but to go, one of the reasons though, why I believe that that experience is so tragic, um, is not, it, it, not only what it does for the person, but even what it does to the icon, so to speak, that, that inverts the uh, meaning and message the icon is designed to portray. And which is why as well, I think that one of the major images for um, idolatry, for injustice, for betraying God, you know, is if the people of God are designed to, you know, if we're to be his bride in union with him, and one of the major images throughout the scriptures for betraying God and walking away is adultery and prostitution. It's, 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 mean to, to other lovers rather than that covenantal union we're made for with God. Mm-hmm. And I also think it's worth noting that there is a gender dynamic, right, with rape and, and prostitution, that um, rapists are virtually universally men. I, like it's it's almost uh, across the board. The, the exception, uh, where, where there's the rare exception, it's usually a, another kind of power dynamic, like a teacher with a student, that kind of thing. But 99 point something percent of rape is, is male uh, as the perpetrator, right? And we see that, I think, too, within the Me Too movement and the sexual assault or the abuse of, of power in a relationship. And I think that speaks to something embedded in the nature of the icon. There is a, a power dynamic at, at play that, um, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we see it in our culture. Like, it's, you look at domestic violence statistics, you look at rape, you look at sexual assault, you look at all that, and that there is generally something that is leans more to the, the male side of the equation where 
something that was designed for generosity is actually abused and exploited and manipulated and misused um, for the self in a way that rape tends to be a corruption way more prevalent on the male side of the mm -hmm. icon, right? Mm -hmm. And as well as with hospitality, you look at, you know, prostitutes can be male or female. Uh, you know, it's, it's more prominent, statistically it would be more significantly a female Christian population, but even when it's men, it's uh, on the receiving end of sexual union almost always, right? So even if you're a male prostitute, you, you get paid to be penetrated, not to penetrate, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's I, I think that highlights again that there is a dynamic within the icon itself of Christ and the church, generosity and hospitality, that these, um, these corruptions kind of invert or turn in upon themselves in a way that distorts the design for the, of the gospel that God's embedded for it to ideally display. Josh, that's, that's a, that's a super keen observation. Is that your observation? Is that something you've, you've pieced together through looking at scripture, praying and reading over time? Uh, yeah. I mean, not, not the statistics of how many, you know, but of course, yeah, of course, but the dinner, yeah. hospitality, kind of the, the rape and, and yeah prostitution so it's it's really it's really insightful it's really helpful uh and and you make this point and i, I really like it it's a point worth making of of god doesn't have union with us until he first has covenant with us that that god never exploits us that way by coming into us or inviting us into himself without that union first being uh um the garland around the relationship Yes, yeah, I think the way I put it is, you know, God commits to us before he unites with us. Yeah, yeah that's good. And God's like, this is the marriage coming. God's going like, I'm all in. I'll never leave or forsake you. I'm not going anywhere. You can yeah. trust <laughs> me. Like, I, there's no, uh, there's security in my love. There's no fear in my love. So I ain't yeah. going anywhere. I'm not going to abuse you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to say it's, it's the wedding vows. God initiates with those vows. Yeah. And, you know, the other people <laughs> who's maybe going to mention that is, you know, I mentioned rape and prostitution, and those are the most tragic inversions but I'll say there's more subtle inversions as well, right? Mm. Um, so you don't have to go all the way as far as rape, for example, that generosity, maybe more commonly, it can also become self-gratification, mm. right? Like trying to get what you can from the other rather than give yourself to the other. Mm. And once again, I found that that generosity, that, that more subtle inversion of generosity um, tends to be more something that men tend to struggle with more than women. Not universally, women can as well, but generally speaking, uh, yes. men tend to uh, struggle a bit, a bit more with that. And I think there's kind of a, a pro tip there for the husbands, you know, going like, you slow down, you know, you're not a Maserati, the goal isn't to get to 60 and 4.2 seconds or, you know, like, like that, that actually Jesus tells us to, um, you know, that it's better to give than to receive. And that applies mm -hmm. in the bedroom as, with our, you know, wife yeah. as much as it does anywhere. And yeah. if you're a woman and you have the, you know, the, the same thing, but the that they're to watch out for those more subtle inversions because as a pastor I, i've walked with a lot of marriages over the years i've found that that's one struggle that some marriages have is um lives or even with college students who maybe they aren't walking fully with jesus yet but you know but uh, where the girl can often feel more used in the relationship by the guy you know like he just wants what he can get from me and then he's uninterested and moving on um so i, I think there's a, an inversion that humans in general, but men in particular need to be on guard for, you know, uh, am I seeking to give myself to this person in covenant or within the, you know, security and context of covenant, or am I seeking to get what I can from this person for my own kind of self gratification. And on the hospitality side, there can be a more subtle inversion within marriage of being kind of unwelcoming, right? Like of not, uh, yeah, uh, of not welcoming or bringing the, the, the other person in and, both men and women can struggle with that. But again, like been a lot of marital counseling over the years and nine times out of 10, it's usually not the guy going, I have a headache. She just wants sex too much. You know, like it's often something that uh, wives can tend to struggle with a little more than uh, husbands, particularly as life gets busy and kids come along and schedules, schedules get rampant, you know, like, um, so Paul talks about, man, making time for say, like it's okay to abstain for a while for prayer and all that, but coming back together in union. Mm it's helpful for husbands and wives to go do we're going to prioritize time for intimacy and union together kind of renewing coming back to that covenantal that uh union at the heart of our covenant together yeah. and space where this is 
for, you know, going to be about self-giving rather than self-gratification and yes. actually prioritize making time to be with my spouse. Even yeah. if, if I need to, uh, yeah, make some time for it. Cause I not always feeling like, you know, that that is something that is sacred that God's put at the center of, uh, a union at the center of your marital union and yes. prioritize and make space for that. If I remember correctly, that's, that's, that was Lewis's argument against ma- kind of masturbation as a private practice. Um, that it takes something that's in, inher- it's supposed to be inherently selfless and makes it, uh, it makes it exclusively selfish. Mm. Um, uh, Josh, I, I should have, I should have probably led with this. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I led, I, I have lived the first 30 years of my life single. I'm engaged now. Um, but I, I know what it's like to hear about how awesome sex is and marriage is and how it points to God and the gospel and all sorts of cool things. And all the while feeling incomplete or like less of a human being, like I can reflect less of God as a single dude or a single person. Um, so just a, a simple disclaimer, uh, what would you say for the the person who's single? And they're like, all right, how do I connect with any of this, Josh? Awesome. The good news, you can have the reality without the sign, you know, mm-hmm. you can have the, you can have the movie without the sneak previews, right? Like <laughs> that, um, cause I do think there, one of the lies in our culture is like, you need sex to find meaning, fulfillment, you need romance, you need, you need those things. And the reality is you don't, you know, like, uh, I, I love Carl Truman in his new book. He mentions something like, uh, you know, nobody in our culture needs to be told that the movie, the 40 year old virgin is a comedy. Yes. You know, yes. Everybody knows like, ah, oh, if you're 40 and you haven't had sex yet, then you're missing out, whatever. Uh, but that's a lie. I mean, the reality is Jesus was a 40 year old virgin. <laughs> or yes. Yes. Year old one. Yeah. And he lived the most meaningful, fulfilling life ever. And yes. it feels like you don't need, uh, you know, sex to have a meaningful, fulfilling life. Uh, you'd be single like Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. Jesus was single, Paul was single. So if you're single, you're in, in good company. Mm-hmm. But what I'd say is this, that, um, you don't need set, you know, Jesus, I, I like to think of Jesus as being the glorious bachelor and the great groom or something like mm-hmm. that. Right? Like, on the one hand, Jesus is the glorious bachelor. I mean, he never had sex. He wasn't married all that. Like in life, he gave up sex on the horizontal level, mm-hmm. but in order to give his life for, the sacred marriage on a divine, on a vertical level, mm, mm. right as its people. And the reality is uh, single or married alike, what we both have access to is that marital union with Christ, with our very creator, which man, I love my wife. I love marriage, but man, union with Jesus is actually a hundred times more better. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's the ultimate thing that we were all designed for um, mm. is with God. And so that's the salvation that sex is designed to point to and there are unique, I love, uh, I think Sam Albury makes the point. So, so something about how like, like marriage reveals the shape of the gospel, but singleness reveals the sufficiency of the gospel mm-hmm. that even if, uh, that marriage is still important for the single person, because it points to the, the, the dynamic that we're made for with God, but you don't need, again, you don't need the scene preview. You can have the movie. You don't need the signpost. You can get the reality. You don't need the icon. You can actually have, you have actually have access in the gospel to the very mm-hmm. thing designed to point to you mm. and um that in my estimation is is powerful that's mm. where the goods the goods are at is union with jesus and the very life of god yeah yeah i've heard i've heard people say something along the lines of <clears throat> singleness shows us the kind of the the exclusive union that'll be had in the kingdom and uh and there's even a, a sign in that you know and that's that's a beautiful thing as well when like we won't be given in marriage because in the kingdom, because we'll all be, well, we'll all be married to him, you know? And there are uh single folk in my life who live lives of celibacy and they have relationships with Jesus that I love peering into. And I just long to peer into on a daily basis. Really remarkable. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I dig all of that. Um, shape and sufficiency. I, I hadn't heard it said in that way. And I really appreciate that. So Josh, I, I guess as a, as a kind of, kind of, uh, outro, I, I'd love to hear 
maybe kind of maybe a rearticulation about kind of union sex as salvation, but I mean, also like, why does, why does this matter? Like why does seeing sex rightly matter? Yeah, that is a great question. Well, why this matters, you know, a couple of thoughts. One is, um, I mean, what I would say, like the power, even the motivating power for us as followers of Jesus, when we move from what I call like from rule keeping to image bearing, mm-hmm. you know, where if the goal is, I just got to keep these rules to make God happy and make sure I don't mess up. Like that can get you so far, you know, that's good. But I find it way more, it's not to say the God's rules, God's law, that, that doesn't matter, but it's because there's actually a deeper motivation in the gospel, mm-hmm. which is going like, Dude, it's not just, it's, it, it's more than that. It's actually, how do I bear the image and reflect accurately the image of who God is, who Christ is? How do we in our sexual relationships, um, how, how, and how we approach sex, sexual, all that, how do we actually reflect this image of Christ and the church in our marriages? Hmm. That feels way more compelling and motivating to me to go, not just like, how do I keep the rules, but actually, how do I reflect hmm. Christ and his church? It's actually a call to embody the gospel. <laughs> you know, it's actually a call yeah. to act in how we approach singleness and marriage. It actually becomes a call to not just obey Jesus, but to reflect Jesus mm-hmm. into the world. Mm-hmm. And that is powerful. That's going, man, I'm actually being invited to participate in the life of Jesus by reflecting who he is into the world mm-hmm. and how I approach singleness and how I approach marriage as his followers. It moves me from simply rule keeping to image bearing to Amen being the icon, embodying the image, like actually participating in this thing that God has designed to reveal something of who he is to the world. Mm-hmm. Josh, you're awesome. I've enjoyed this time so much. I think we would try to get you on. I think we were trying to work together since like the fall. So it's so great to, to finally have you on here. You've just been such a, a gift to us. We always, we always end with just two questions. One, how can people track with you? And then two, how can people be praying for you? Great. Thank you, uh, man. As far as track with me, uh, I, you know, I'm on, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and I'll, you need know, to search my name, Instagram, whatever, but I gotta say, I kind of suck at social media. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not uh, the quickest or most responsive out there a ton. Uh, but I, I am out there. I've got kind of a website and again, this new book should be coming out this, this upcoming year. Um, but then on the other side, uh, you know, how can you pray for me? That's a great question. Uh, even kind of related to the social media. Um, I've been having some big eyesight issues uh, mm-hmm. this last six months or so. It's uh, that's part of the reason I'm I'm less on social media right now. It's a long story, um, but the short of it is, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I kind of went blind in one eye, and then there's mm-hmm. other stuff the other. And obviously, I do a ton of writing, reading, wow. you know, preach all that kind of stuff. So, um, dude, God's been good. I've got people around, and you know, specialist doctors, where it's been great. But uh, if you would feel so led to pray for. Uh, just my my eyesight and kind of walking with Jesus through those mm-hmm. issues right now, and um, just the and within that too, just the desire to continue, uh, do, yeah, doing you know writing on some of these, thinking through some of these things. Yeah. Uh, that would be that would be immensely appreciated. Dude, thank you so much for sharing that with us. We will absolutely be with you in that. I, I really appreciate you being here again. You've been a gift and. And it is worth saying you've been a big brother to so many of us from afar and we're just really grateful for your work and, uh, and what you are in, in, in his body, what you are to us. So thank you for, for just you being you and, uh, hanging with us, playing with us in his kingdom today. Thanks Shane. I appreciate it, man. Uh, thank you so much for hanging with us today. I hope you enjoyed the time with Joshua Ryan Butler. If you did, please share it with somebody you think would benefit from it. Uh, I loved tracking through, as Josh would say, the icon of sex and the significance of sex. It's always been intuitive to me that sex is important and meaningful, uh, but the messages I get from the culture around me speak to the contrary of that. And so I I really just needed, uh, well, this kind of conversation to help uh, give me a compass, a heading, as I try and look at culture, look at sex, and just understand my own identity better. as well as our identity with Jesus. That that union speak is really beautiful language, and I want to spend the rest of my life exploring it. Uh, but that's enough. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us. This is The Naked Gospel, and we will catch you next time.